Please stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. King Herod heard of the disciples preaching <clears throat> for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. When, <clears throat> but when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, beyond, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask of me, I will give to you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? And she replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the king, the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Well, the king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oath and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. And immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. <clears throat> Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. These words, these powerful greetings, were shared by the author of today's text and appear in 13 other letters in the New Testament. Grace, meaning the unmerited favor of God, founded in his love, and peace, holistic, deep wellness. In today's Ephesians text, Paul, or someone not unlike him, pushes the envelope of hyperbolic superlatives to praise God's glorious grace. That phrase comes three times in these 12 verses, but in Greek, they are only one sentence. Paul gives us this single sentence that comes in at a surprising length of 257 words. Paul takes the basic thought of God has blessed us in verse 3 and explores it from the widest possible angle. We realize that we have been blessed from eternal past to eternal future, say verses 4 and 14, but also by receiving a redemption purchased by the blood of Christ in verse 7. We realize that the Father has blessed us by predestining us for salvation. The Son has blessed us by dying for us. And the Spirit has blessed us by sealing us for a future redemption beyond our, beyond our wildest dreams. All of this we receive, quote unquote, in Christ. A thread that runs a dozen or so times in this passage. And all of this results in praise of the God who has done it and the glorious grace that he has lavished upon us. And as I said, all of this is presented in a single sentence in Greek. Our English Bibles do not present it this way so that we can handle the words more comfortably. But there is a copy uh, of this single sentence in Coffee Hour, if you're interested to see it, 
someone took the trouble to get it into English in a single sentence with a couple of modifications. So if that's of interest to you, it's in there by the coffee. Now, before I spend any more time with the Ephesians text, I, I, I'd like to provide some details about the author, the location, and the letter itself. I believe it's important to provide this information now because the New Testament readings for the rest of July and into August follow along the balance of Ephesians. So here are some other facts to consider as a letter of, to the Ephesians is presented to you in the coming weeks. Starting with the author. Was it Paul? Well, maybe. But not just because it's stated so in verse 1, that it is from Paul. While the text does sum up many of the important themes of the other letters known to be written by Paul, such as Romans and the pair of letters to the Christians at Corinth, the scholars tell us that this letter has styles of language use that are not typical of Paul. Given the material in the letter, which is fully Christian in its concepts, I recommend that the naming of the specific author is not all that important However, for my message today, I will use Paul. Was the letter's destination the Christians at Ephesus alone? Or was it to all the Christians in Asia Minor? Since the phrase in Ephesus is lacking in some early manuscripts, and also since the letter lacks personal greetings that would have been present if it were addressed primarily to the believers at Ephesus, why? because we know that in the book of Acts, we learn that Paul spent three years there. So it seems as though he might have said, hi, Prisca, hi, Ach Ach Achilla. But he didn't, and that, that those words were not in the letter. So my conclusion is that this letter was likely a circular letter sent to the Gentile believers in the churches in Southwest Asia Minor. There was a connection to Ephesus because of the importance of that city. It was situated at an intersection of major land routes. And because it was one of the cities that actually did get to read that letter. All right, now regarding its purpose, Ephesians is the least situational of all the letters because it doesn't explicitly address any specific problem. However, as a circular letter, it is a manifesto describing the church's essence and identity, who it is and how it must conduct itself, what the church's mission is within the larger framework of Christ's cosmic rule and its reconciliation with Christ that this letter emphasizes the cosmic grace and unity in Christ. And it's important to keep in mind that when the letter to the Ephesians was written in the late first century, many of its ideas might have been new perhaps somewhat startling to the people who read it or heard it for the first time. When we consider the letter's content from this angle, we can, <clears throat> we can see not just what is unique to Ephesians, but also how striking some of the letter's components are, despite the fact that the letter has become part and parcel of Christian thought. You know, I wish I knew who the Christians in Ephesus really were. As the apostle writes to them, the words are powerful and that he uses to help them understand the sense of belonging we find in Christ. My wife Sally and I had a chance to walk the streets of ancient Ephesus in 2016. We spent the better part of a day there. We got to see where the Ephesians of the first century lived and got a feel for how they lived. Ephesus back then was a vital seaport and that made it a relatively full of cultural crossroads. There was much beauty and opportunity in a place like the Ephesus of Paul's time. Like most gatherings within the fledgling Christian movement, there would have been a scattering of Jews, but obviously there would have been a tremendous number of Gentiles as well. The culture was pluralistic, including the variety of spiritual beliefs and practices that people may have held. Getting Jew and Gentile on the same spiritual page in the name of Christ would not have been an easy task then, as it is not now. Getting Christian pilgrims and pagan seekers, especially in a Hellenistic age of intellectual curiosity, into a shared practice of faith would have been really a huge challenge. 
Now, this Apostle Paul will tell the Galatians, another one of his letters in chapter 3 of that letter, that there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That is the Paul who makes the case in our Ephesian scripture today, that in Christ, all who come to God through him are adopted and blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Yes, I do wish I knew those ancient Ephesians and just what this news meant to them. A body of believers, we might call them, but one with an amazing inheritance of hope, possibility, and eternity at his disposal. They, they were everything I've just said, but had to be so, despite their noticeable diversity, just like the church of today. Diversity like people who aren't the same age, don't all think just alike, don't always interpret culture and events quite the same. People who aren't necessarily doing the same thing and don't always believe just the same, still trying to find unity of spirit and action brought together by their salvation in Jesus Christ, their hope because of that, and God's calling upon their lives. Perhaps human differences may no longer surprise us. In America today, despite the efforts of many to deny and to try to perpetuate outdated views, we are obviously quite a diverse country. But in Christ, God has made different groups into one and has broken down the dividing walls, any hostilities among us. This was no small feat then, nor is it now. And that's important because what is at stake is God's adoption of the church. According to the apostle, adoption was not as uncommon in ancient days as we might think, especially among wealthy or prominent households. Adoption might be a means to having heirs. The Bible demonstrates that one measure of wealth was the number of children one had. <clears throat> it is not who would be saved by Paul that seems to speak of. It is that any who follow God in Christ already have assurances of salvation taken care of, predestined. It is just that a long time ago, God acted to make a way for grace in Jesus Christ for any of us. And this is an important section of Paul's letter that celebrates the blessings that we might receive when we follow Christ. It brought welcome news that we, the 21st century Christians, may tend to take for granted, especially for those who may have been exiled or displaced at that time, and certainly who were living as Roman citizens in a vast empire against their choice. This might have sounded like good news. Maybe you felt exiled at some point in your life. Or maybe something challenging, challenging has moved into your life and made you feel as though the way you had known was now being occupied by an invading circumstance. We may struggle to understand, much less relate to, all the specific dynamics of life in Ephesus back then. We might not fully grasp what it was like to be a citizen there, much less Christ followers 2,000 years ago in the Roman Empire. But I would imagine you've had times when you may not have felt quite at home in your life for a stretch. Perhaps you even felt you have been picked up and set down in the middle of someone else's life. Medical issues like the pandemic, which we have been enduring for the last year or so, or a challenging diagnosis in your health, an accident or the like, they can all remind us of how quickly life can change. Cultural upheaval and widespread disagreement, especially in a social media age, can make us feel alone or frustrated at times. Loss or fear, change and instability can make us feel uncertain for a while. And it was into a season of life like that which the Apostle Paul spoke these words of belonging and inclusion. This was good news that he wanted to offer to believers at Ephesus. 
and they're meant for us, right here in Westland as well. God had made provision for them and for us too. They were adopted for a family and inheritance, the family of God and Jesus. They belong to a holy lineage in Christ that we can still belong to today. Paul's good news is that we do belong to God as adopted and provided for children in Christ. The good news doesn't end there, though. We also can belong to each other, which is why our spiritual fellowships or churches are so vital to our Christian life. We can find companions for the journey. We can be companions for others, lending to each other the resources that the Spirit leads us to share. Listen to one key dimension that we have been given in Christ. It is from verse 7 of the Ephesian text. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. God will redeem and forgive. God will renew and transform. Just as we don't get to hold on to our best moments, our worst moments will not be our last either, and it won't be left to define us. God in Christ has defined us. I may wonder what life was like in ancient Ephesus, but one thing I know from this is that I share life in Christ with them and with you all. I find that compelling. I find that somehow comforting. Today's cultural differences, which can divide us and end up testing our very faith, are not all that unlike some of the diversity Paul would have known among the Ephesians. These are timeless promises. They are written to a humanity that advances in so many measurable ways, but a humanity that yearns to connect with divine power and maybe with others who have been led to be people of faith. God will include and lead us. Through the presence of the Spirit, God will guide us. The divine will recognize us as family, perhaps sometimes just when we need that inclusion the most. May we go and do likewise. May we model and challenge one another toward the very best for which these riches were intended. For we have also heard the word of truth. I began my message today with a greeting of grace and peace to all of you listening today. I now close by asking you all to consider are there any in your life to whom you may be struggling to extend grace or struggling to feel peace in your relationship with them? Why not consider some practical steps this week that you can take to show that grace and to share that peace with those people? Amen.